next talk in the session will be about building your first OpenStack application with OpenStack Python SDK. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next speaker, Victoria Martinez de la Cruz. So, uh, hi everybody, welcome. Uh, this is Build Your First OpenStack application with the OpenStack Python SDK. Um, so, uh, a few uh, heads up. This is not a training. Um, I know that the, the title could be a little confusing, but this presentation has been went through a lot of changes in the time in which I started, you know, uh, checking out the tools that we already have and the, the latest updates uh, within the OpenStack community with regards to this topic. So uh, this is not going to be a training, but an overview of what we have currently in OpenStack community for building applications on top of OpenStack. Um, and so this is not a deep dive of uh, the OpenStack Python SDK. Uh, we are just going to see how to use it, but we are not going. Well, I don't want to bore you with the internals of how it's implemented or how it's, it's like, I, I don't make sense for me, so I, I don't think it's going to make sense for you. Um, so uh, how is it going to be this presentation then? This presentation is going to be threefold, in which um, I'm, I'm going to start with a few of, uh, anecdotes of how was my path on creating uh, working on building application of OpenStack. Um, then we are going to see the tools we have currently in OpenStack community for, for this purpose. And then we are going to finish with a few tips and tricks of building uh, cloud-centric deployments uh, for, uh, well, clouds in general, not only about OpenStack. So, uh, I'm Victoria Martinez de la Cruz. I'm software engineer at Red Hat. I'm currently working full-time uh, in OpenStack. Um, I'm not what you would say a cloud developer, like I don't develop applications for to run the cloud, but I'm a cloud builder. <laughs> um, another thing about me is that I'm co-founder of the community Linux Chips Argentina. Um, I'm very, very proud about this, uh, so every time I have the possibility I mention it, and this is one of these fam fabulous opportunities to do that. So here it is. So what is OpenStack? Uh, this seems like, okay, you are giving a presentation about OpenStack, and I, I would expect the audience to know about this, but in previous um, conference, I noticed that there is not, you know, a good sense of what it is and what is the current thought about that. And just between, uh, between us, uh, the amount of projects that arise and in the OpenStack ecosystem is so wide that often we OpenStack developers lose the sense of what is there and what is not. So it's always good to to do a brief overview of what is the current status of OpenStack. Um, but first, let's see uh, what is OpenStack in, in, in broader terms. So, uh, broadly speaking, uh, OpenStack is what you would say an, an operative system for data centers. More specifically, it provides a set of tools that allow you to handle uh, resources that can be compute, networking, and storage, generally speaking. Uh, through a single entry point, which can be, well, in this diagram is the OpenStack dashboard depicted, but it can be another uh, interface or a script or whatever. Um, OpenStack started being um, infrastructure as a service, which the main components in the top of this uh, diagram. We have uh, different kinds of storage, the object storage and the uh, block storage. We have uh, the identity project also uh, compute networking and an image service. And then with, the, with time and with the, well, um, pike of this, uh, there has been a lot of new projects that are more like in a higher abstraction level that can be considered to be platform as a service, in which we can talk about, for instance, uh, database as a service, project through, uh, messaging services, um, telemetry, uh, big data, shared file systems, Manila, which is the process I'm currently working on, uh, containers, orchestration, bare metal provisioning, DNS, you name it. There are a lot of projects like this. Uh, these are not all, but these are the projects that have been in OpenStack ecosystem for a while now and are considered like to be, you know, um, part of the big tent. Um, so, running apps on OpenStack, how it was a few years back at least. Um, now I'm going to tell you which was my first experience working on building um, a, an application to run an OpenStack. Um, this started 
this happened on a conference that is called uh, Grace Hopper Celebration. Uh, it happened in 2014. Um, we had what it was named the Open Source Day, and it was the topic of this Open Source Day was to uh, create, um, to contribute to projects that are, had social impact uh, by using open source technologies. Um, it was a really great crew, mostly people from Rackspace, and they invited me to join, you know, to, to be a guide for, for that uh, workshop. And honestly, it was like, okay, I have no idea about this, honestly, but it sounds like a great idea, so why are you going to say no? So, um, I say yes, and I started looking into what was going to, to be done in that workshop. And, uh, well, um, when they started telling me what was the idea of this, they told me that um, we were going to leverage uh, the scalability and resiliency that OpenStack as, as a platform has uh, to, to cover um, situations in which there, there are need or disasters. Uh, for that, we picked an application. Uh, we did a lot of research, and one of the applications that caught our attention was Ushahidi, which is a tool that allows you to, to gather, to collect data, and to display it in a way that allows us uh, to uh, react to those events in a more organized way. Um, this application is open source. Um, it's uh, great in PHP. That, that is not the best part of it, but well, uh, <laughs> the whole idea of the application is awesome, and we decided to, to deploy that application. And for that, we have uh, to, you know, since this application was not intended to be run on a cloud, it was an application that's general, it's like any other else, right? Uh, we had to define a cloud-ready architecture um, for it, and to the, the, the key of this was to be able to deploy this application in a way that was um, and fast and that required no integration from us. That was writing a script to automatize that, right? So in preparation for this, since I was going to attend to this workshop, and it was like, OK, I have no idea, so I had to get ready for this. I tried to um, you know, define an architecture for it, like the simplest one. I came to this uh, architecture that is depicted in this diagram. It is pretty simple, as you see. It's uh, just two web servers with running the application, uh, one DB and one load balancer on the other end. So it's HA. And can react to changes. Um, and okay, so once I have this diagram done, it was like, okay, uh, so now with the tools that we have in the community, how are we are going to um, automate this? How are we going to write this script? And of course, I, I ended up uh, looking at the OpenStack Python clients. Uh, each of those projects uh, I show in, in one of the first slides um, have a client. and. Uh, it sounded to be like the most natural way of, of, of building my application in this case. But the data started to lose sense pretty quickly. And let me show you just one example. Usually when you are building an application, you are going you know, to perform you know, trivial operations like create a server, uh, delete a server, list servers, you know, to access to them, to launch them, to install things on them. Um, this is um, an example of the list command for the Nova client. Uh, as you can see, instantiating the client is pretty straightforward. You just pass the user the password and the author you love on the project you are working on. Um, you can list the servers that way. It's pretty straightforward. And you access the resources, uh, sorry, the attributes of your resources uh, through a dot .call. That's pretty normal. But now let's going to see, OK, I, I, I want an image uh, for this uh, server I'm going to launch, right? So. Let's see how uh, Glance managed uh, this uh, operation. Uh, you can see already that uh, instant in a client has a different signature. It has less parameters, right? You don't have the user and password there. You only have a token and now URL. And when you are listing the, the images, OK, you access them the same way, but then you are handling a dictionary. But just to add more to, to this example, this Take a look on how Swift handle um, this uh, operation. Um, the connection is like a, a merge of between the two of, uh, we, we saw previously. Um, 
then we have to access to the container for Swift in, in this strange way that get account. We don't know what we're doing that. So it's like we get the containers and we access them through a dictionary. OK. I'm being a software engineer working full time. And OpenStack is like, OK, it, it is weird, but whatever. But someone that is, you know, trying to use the cloud and have everything working, like, don't, don't burden with the, the syntax, right? Uh, ended up like this. This is the, you know, <laughs> graphically visualization of how a probably a cloud developer would then when trying to, to deploy their applications in OpenStack. So um, this is certainly a problem. It is not, the thing is like, um, there is a misconception of how uh, people usually take the, the, the Python clients. It, it, this actually is, is fine that it happens because the clients were intended officially uh, to, to create the command line interface we use for OpenStack. It's not, uh, when, when they, they were developed, they were not intended for the users to, to use it, right? So this is okay. It's, it's how to be, it's uh, how it's expected to be. But, of course, so if there is okay, then there is something missing. How are users supposed to interact with the cloud, in like, in, like in the whole concept of the cloud, in an easy way? So um, just to end up the anecdote of the Grace Hopper celebration experience and everything, we ended up uh, using, well, the diagram I show, we, we follow the same architecture, but uh, we ended up using a library that is called Apache Lib Cloud, uh, which I'm going to mention, I'm going to talk about a bit more about that in the upcoming uh, slides. So everything went perfect. We have all the applications going on, and it was an amazing experience. And it uh, let me, you know, the feeling that there was something to do on the OpenStack development area, right? So, no, let's talk about uh, the libraries and SDKs we have currently on the OpenStack ecosystem that you can use, uh, of course, based in Python. Um, there are SDKs and libraries for a lot of languages. If you uh, check it out, the uh, well, the wiki page that we have in OpenStack that deletes all of them, you are going to see that there are a lot, several alternatives for different languages and uh, it's, it's, it looks like a mess. But for the Python ones, let's, let's take a look at the ones that I think is worth mentioning. So why we need libraries? Why we need SDKs? Um, as I mentioned, there is no way, like, there is no simple, straight, straightforward way to interact with an OpenStack cloud. So, uh, because we have, okay, lots of services, we have one library per services, and we have for each one of the library a different user experience. So imagine that lots of libraries and user experience is, is, is painful for developers. So, um, in Python we have these three options. Let's start with this one, with Apache Leaf Club, the one we use for the Grace Hopper celebration. Um, it uh, um, offers you a unified API. The good thing about uh, this library in particular is that it allows you to talk to different uh, clouds. It doesn't, it's, it's, it's not only for OpenStack, but allows you to talk with, I don't know, different implementations of OpenStack clouds. It allows, it allows you to interact with Amazon, with Azure, and you name it. There are a lot of clouds that allows you, um, that has plugins for Apache Live Cloud. Um, the only thing is that, of course, this is not a tool that is being developed by the OpenStack community. It's third party. Uh, but it's, it worth look at it. Here is a sample of how um, creating a server for OpenStack would look like using this library. As you can see, it's, it's pretty clear what is, doing, what is happening there. Um, you simply create, talk the, um, take the plugin for OpenStack that you have for LibCloud you instance that uh, client, you basically uh, get a size that for the server you are uh, launching, an image that we want to use for that server, and simply with driver create node with that information you gather for the cloud you have, you have your node uh, running and working. Now, OpenStack Shade. OpenStack Shade is a project that is, is a library uh, to interact with OpenStack clouds that have been um, born uh, under the OpenStack Infra project. 
the infra project of OpenStack is the project that is taking care of all the of handling all the processes and systems that uh, take care of everything that happens on the OpenStack community. So it's a tool that was born um, to be used internally, right? It is not the, the, the case nowadays. Um, of course, now there are application developers using this tool. Um, and the main, uh, the keyword for probably that describes this tool the best is simplicity. The idea is that you um, get your, your access, your resource in a very simple way. This is awesome, right? But the only downside you have with this is that you don't have, you know, a finer grain control of what we are, you are doing. If your architecture is slightly complex, then you cannot use this tool uh, for deploy your application, right? Just uh, a red flag here. This uh, library is under development. Uh, it's expected to change a lot. Um, the current uh, version of it, you, it's going, well, how to put this right? <laughs> you can use it, but please don't use it in production. Just that. <laughs> so let's see an example of how uh, launching a server and using this tool is going to be. Um, very similar to what we saw for Lib Cloud. Um, we simply create connection to uh, the OpenStack Cloud. Um, we can gather an image uh, from your file system in that way. Um, you get your, your, the size for your, your server very simply with well, get flavor program, for instance, and then you create your server uh, passing those parameters and then you are ready, ready to go. And finally, the OpenStack Python SDK. Um, let's make a stop here for a moment and talk about the difference of why we mentioned the, the, the former two were libraries and this is an SDK. So the SDK, uh, you are able, you, you, you are offered a complete set of libraries, tools, documentation, like examples that are, you know, jargon free. You are not going to see Nova or Keystone or any of the names we use within OpenStack for you to manage your cloud. Uh, it, it is, um, you, you don't have to have knowledge of what's going on there. You simply say, okay, give me a server, give me an image, wherever, and you have the, a lot of examples to cover that. Uh, an SDK is mo much more complete than a library. Uh, this um, SDK is aimed for all type of users, users of OpenStack Clouds, consumer of OpenStack Clouds, that is you probably, uh, operators of OpenStack Clouds, and developers of OpenStack projects like me. The idea is that you install once and you can run anywhere in any uh, OpenStack Cloud implementation you have. Um, so, why I choose this tool among the three that we just mentioned? Uh, so, well, Apache Lib Cloud, of course, I, I, I'd rather uh, talk about tools that we are um, developing in the OpenStack community. So, of course, I, I'd rather to stay with Shade or OpenStack SDK. And in the case of um, Shade, it was like, okay, this it was a tool that was being used for internal purposes. So if there is something that is more targeted to what uh, we are talking today is the open Python SDK. It's a very valuable use case that we are talking about. And uh, uh, whereas it's under development as well as trade, um, I think this project requires a lot more attention and a lot more of, you know, spreading the voice and uh, showing how it's supposed to be used. So this, uh, SDK is already on PyPy, so basically you pip install OpenStack SDK and you have it there for you. Um, as mentioned, it allows you to write automation scripts that allow you to create and manage resources in, in any OpenStack cloud. Now let's uh, stop for a moment and talk about uh, how is this SDK structure, what are you going to find when you interact with this SDK. Um, basically, it uh, has been structured in a two-layer approach in which you have a connection interface and a resource interface. Um, the connection interface is the one that you as an OpenStack uh, cloud consumer are going to use. It allows you to uh, access to your session authentication, transport, and profile through two classes. One is the connection and one is the profile. And the resource layer, you are not supposed to use that, but um, it, it is there, you, you can access it if you have needs to have a more fine-grained control over what you are handling. 
it is more aimed to be used by, I guess, um, OpenStack developers if they want to do something fancy or whatever. But resource uh, layer take connection objects and it's, it's not what you want to do. So you are going to stick with the connection interface and with the classes that the connection interface provides. Um, some snippets. So how is to um, create a connection with a cloud? It's for any cloud you have, it's going to be the same. You are going to instantiate your connection in, in this fashion in which you have the auth URL, where you have your authentication, person name, username, and password. You can interact with all the services in your cloud just by this connection. Then uh, in order to create a server, uh, well, I added a few more steps here, but basically you would need an image in which uh, your server is going to use, a flavor, which is the size of the instance you are launching, a network, um, if you already define it, but it will require another snippet of code to do that, um, and a keeper to access your server. Then you simply uh, specify, okay, compute, key server, and you should be good with that. Another example is creating a keeper, as mentioned in, in the previous slide, for access your instance. Uh, here I'm showing you how if you have a keeper already uh, in your cloud, you can find it by name. Or if you don't have it, you can grab it from your local file system and upload it to your cloud in that fashion. Um, there is some extra code that interacts with the operating system I'm using. But the part of the SDK is a few lines only. And since um, it was like, okay, for up the um, creation, um, the part of OpenStack is already covered, right? As the only thing you need to, to have is something like the Python OpenStack SDK. But something that, um, you know, come to my attention during the um, app creation workshop was that sometimes developers doesn't have um, a real understanding on how how is to create applications or how to take full profit of the cloud infrastructure you have. So I, I wanted to make this appendix in which um, I want to leave a few guidelines for you uh, for uh, app creation on the cloud. Um, after all, you know, uh, it's sometimes not about the tool, but how you use the tool. So uh, let's uh, talk about a common classification that has been gaining popularity in the last couple of uh, years, I would say. Um, there is a difference between cloud-ready applications and cloud-centric applications. The cloud-ready ones are the ones that are standard, you know, like Ushahidi in, in, in this presentation example, um, that are cloud-centric because are not, they, they were not intended to be run on the cloud in the first place, but they can work perfectly when you deploy it in, in um, in a, like in a microservice uh, architecture, and they won't uh, fall short because of that. And cloud-centric are the ones that were born in the cloud, that were intended to work on the cloud. Of course, that may, probably most of you um, will interact with cloud-ready application, not with cloud-centric application. And whereas you have this uh, close um, ready application, it, it doesn't mean that you have to change all the code, you know, to start from scratch with your applications in order to have them running on the cloud. Um, this uh, classification is just so, to mention that there, there is a new trend on cloud-centric applications and that uh, there is a slight difference, but it's, it's not so much. Um, so, one of the probably cornerstones that I, I hate is that you have to take into account that the topology of your application is going to be dynamic. If your application has to change, it's going to change. Um, it is not like usual, you know, uh, virtualization spaces in which you were used to have, you know, uh, your application all in one with your DV and everything just in one instance and you will take care of it and everything. The um, environments and in the cloud change uh, very dynamically. You are going to, you know, destroy and create new instances very frequently. And that's the whole point of the cloud computing, right? Um, the idea of having this uh, dynamic topology is that you will be able to scale individual components uh, easier. Uh, you will be able to uh, simplify the maintenance and reuse of your applications. 
uh, there you are going to have more fault tolerance. And one example of how you are going to do this is, for instance, the hardcore information about networking uh, delegated to the networking services, in the case of OpenStack to Neutron. Um, what else? If we merely storage, don't assume, please, that the storage that you have in your instance is going to be persistent. Like, for instance, um, for all the static and non-static data you have in your application. For example, your logs, right? When you install your application in your instance, uh, usually you store your logs under bar log, right? But what happens if that instance uh, fails and goes down and you want to check it out what happened with application, then all the logs you have in your system are missing because the ephemeral storage is, as the word says, ephemeral. So um, you can use, it's advice for you to use a um, persistent storage solution, like an OpenStack, it could be the block storage Cinder or the object storage Swift. Um, you only have to delegate that uh, task to an external uh, service. What else, stateless. Um, statefulness of any sort limits the scalability of an application. Um, if possible, you should be able to omit using a state, to keep a state. If you can omit it, uh, try to store the station state in a highly available store outside your application. Just as we, we talk about the um, static and non-static data, the same for state. Um, for instance, you can use database services to spin up uh, DB instance that store all the state of your applications there. Standards, okay, yes, this is not new, probably. Uh, this is, in general, the same for all the applications you, you are going to develop in, in your lifetime, right? Uh, if you can keep with the standards, the better. And of course, uh, in the case of cloud, it, this is even more important because you are going probably to change environments pretty uh, useful, right? Uh, sorry, pretty frequently. Um, so try to avoid using obscure protocols. If you are going to use, I don't know, a transport protocol, try to keep with the common ones with, I don't know, HTTP or whatever. But don't use a protocol that is, you know, corporate just because it looks fancy or it has some features that cuts your attention. Try to stick with, to stick with the, the standards always. And don't rely on always specific features since uh, the application you are, you are deploying um, should be able to change if, if you need to change uh, if, and you tie it with a specific features of the operative system, then you are going to be tied and you won't be able to port it to whatever platform you want. Um, for instance, if you are using a new Linux system, try to use POSIX standards and not use any other. And um, automation. Cloud applications need to be installed frequently or on demand. Um, what does this mean? It's like, it, it, it seems to be, you know, uh, pretty simple, you know, comment. But try to automate the configuration setup. Don't expect a user to be able to, you know, select configuration options or to, please, this, I, I, I don't know, want to say the L word, but if they, they have to sign a license agreement, don't expect them to be able to do so. Um, out Deploying application on a cloud should be um, automatic. You, there should be no user uh, interaction with when, when doing this. And also, the idea is that you can uh, deploy your applications quickly and, uh, um, you know, uh, not having to touch anything. So um, minimize the dependencies required uh, in this step. So that was pretty much it. Um, now I'm going to open for Q&A. Um, Do you have any questions? Yes. Great talk, thank you. Thanks. Um, is Ushahidi still running on OpenStack, or what's kind of been the evolution of that uh, since then? What are the lessons learned uh, that you, you've made out of you know that that application and how it's evolved uh, on the cloud? So um, it was in a public um, tenant when the public Rackspace cloud was up. Um, so there is the like live cloud scripts available, but I don't think the application is still running.
other questions? Yes. So how does the OpenStack SDK uh, handle the differences between the various public clouds that we have in OpenStack? That's a good question. Um, Compared to Shade and others that are built around that, abstracting that difference, how does it behave? So um, you can handle the difference between clouds using the profile uh, class within the OpenStack Python SDK. You have to share a YAML file, I think, that has all the differences with it, and uh, you will use it for all the clouds you want to interact with. Other questions? I have a question myself, if I can. Sure. Uh, I come from the, uh, working with the public clouds. Mm -hmm. So this uh, Python SDK, more or less, it's comparable with, bot with what Boto is for uh, AWS, or uh, it's, it's the Python uh, interface to Amazon Web Services. Honestly, I doesn't put my hands on. I haven't put my hands on the, um, okay. Amazon, but probably if um, yeah, you can spin up instances and thing, configure network and so exactly, on. Exactly, yeah. It's the you can same. interact with the cloud as as a whole, and um, I don't know about Boto, but uh, in the case of Python, uh, OpenStack SDK, you can only interact with OpenStack Cloud. You, you won't be able to use the Python SDK for OpenStack to interact with Amazon, for instance, or Azure. Thank you. No worries. Yes, we have time for other questions. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned pushing state away from the server. It's actually a comment. If anyone here is using Django to build cloud applications, you can use the cookie session store. You've got signed cookies, cryptogra cryptographically secure, and you can push your session, session state into the cookies. Therefore, you don't have any session state on your server, and it's built into Django. You can just use that. So no state on your server for your sessions. Awesome. It's good to know. <laughs> I'm going to take uh, the, the minutes just to mention that there is going to be a training on uh, the developing uh, native applications uh, with Shade that is going to be lit on, on Thursday at 2 p.m. at room E. And we are also organizing an open stack open space on Wednesday, that is tomorrow, um, at afternoon time. We don't know yet the time, but um, we are in the midst of it. If you are interested, please. Follow me on Twitter and I'm going to, to tweet what, in which time and where we are going to do that. <laughs>